Hey, it's a drink with Derek, and I am here with, uh, I'm going to say legendary Detroit broadcaster, because I think that uh, qualifies you. Oh, well, I'm, I, I'm it, it does. I mean, it, Ken yeah. Calvert, who spent many, many years on uh, WRIF uh, Rock Radio in Detroit, also WCSX, 40 plus years in uh, broadcasting. Yeah. And, uh, uh, the voice of my childhood. I'm not going to lie to you. My youth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, if we were to go through all the uh, the call letters that I've uh, worked for, um, the show would be it would basically over. But if you'd like, I will. I can still do them. And because the very first station I ever worked at was the hardest one, and that was WWWW. And I'll never forget the program director said, now look, you get on the ladder, okay? And you go WWWW. And I went, oh. Okay. And he goes, and it's not W, not W, it's double U. Oh, yeah. So, so I started at double uh, W4, and then I went to WABX, and then I went to WRIF, and then I went to WLLZ, then I went to WJR, go figure, and then I went to WCSX, and I retired in 2016, Derek. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You hit for the uh, cycle in Detroit Rock Radio, that's for sure. I did, I did indeed. I did indeed. Yeah, forty-five years. That's insane. Well, and I and I say legendary broadcaster only because I think when people and you talk to friends of mine and just people that I grew up with, and if you grew up in Michigan in the eighties and nineties, um, you know, I, there's literally four voices you can hear on the radio and not have any identification on who they were, and you would know who they were. It was you, mm -hmm. Dick Purton. Yeah. Arthur Penhollow. Oh, yeah. And Ernie Harwell. Oh, wow. That's some that's some rare air that you placed me in there. That's thank you. Thank no, you. seriously, but it's great. Thank great you. to have you on. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. great to uh great to be talking to the uh, soundtrack of uh of my uh, of my bad decisions. <laughs> you know, bad I'm, decisions I'm still... early on. The bad decisions now have different voices playing in the uh, in the background, but uh, yeah, but no, you know, great, to, uh, great to it, see you, it, man. It, you give me one of these. Thank you. So good to see you as well. But you give me one of these, and all of a sudden, I'm inclined to all of a sudden do what I do, which is to start asking questions. So now I will just go shut up, Ken, and let Derek do his show. All right, you know what's so. funny? I was you actually. Well, now you retired from actual yeah. uh, terrestrial radio, but you do a, a podcast called the Ken Calvert Show, which is yeah. uh, super well, cool to listen to. That podcast is the way you archived those interviews with all those amazing artists through the years is just extremely well done. And I encourage anybody, it doesn't matter whether you're in Detroit or Michigan or anywhere on the planet, uh, go to the Ken Calvert show.com and look at the archive of the, uh, of the, uh, of the episodes in there. And just those killer interviews with so many amazing. Yeah. Interviews. Yeah. There, and I have so many more and the thing I'll tell you what happened is that there was a one day that I came home and I, I've, I've, I've always been, I save everything, virtually everything. And I found a big bag, a bag, not a box, a bag, a grocery bag of, of cassettes. And oh back, back in the day, we had these generic brown 90 minute cassettes. Program director would say, make sure you put one in at the beginning and then flip it. And um, it would only activate when the microphone went on. Okay. Yeah, so for those people would, not listening, this is you would do air checks with your program director. Yeah. So they yeah, make sure after. you didn't say something stupid or you didn't sound like an idiot, or they wanted to make sure that you were doing the sound that the, that they wanted you to do. Yeah, and they would always say something like, Now I want to play you something and I wanna I wanna I wanna show you what you did wrong, okay? And I always thought, Yeah, because you were such a gifted broadcaster, Bob. Go ahead. Tell me what I did wrong today. And uh, there was there was a great DJ in Detroit um, by the name of uh, J.P. McCarthy. Oh, yeah. And he could do no wrong. He was the biggest morning guy in the history of Detroit radio. No one will ever come near. Purton came very, very close. But, but J.P. McCarthy was huge. And he had a program director who said to him one time, hey, look, you're talking too much. You're talking about golf. Uh, people don't care about golf. They don't care about the fact that you're driving a Lincoln. They don't care about 90% of the stuff you're talking about. So what I want you to do is go in there tomorrow, be current, you know, keep your eye on the ball, take phone calls. And he was, gosh, you know, you know what, Bob, you're right. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Next day, he went in and talked about his Lincoln, 
talked about golf. He talked about sport fishing in Florida. He talked about everything that he talked about each and every day. Program right. director, program director walks in and says, you see, that was so much better. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> it's like, okay. That's, so that, that about and that sums up a, uh, a program director. How do you tell the guy who was at the number one radio show in uh, period? And then you go, ah, this is how we should refine this. That's like telling, you know, Al Kaline how to change his swing. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's like saying, Al, how do you feel about a number change? <laughs> you know, I, yeah, it's, you I, would, it's mind boggling. You know, what's yeah. funny. I, the, <laughs> I was, I always Google people before I interview them. And I obviously know who you are. I know your website for uh, the podcast. Yeah. But I just Googled Ken Calvert. There's a Ken Calvert representative in California. Did you know this? I do know that. And I've been hearing about that for years. Somebody years and years and years ago. I think he was a congressman. I think he recently retired. Maybe he's still, uh, maybe he's still a congressman in California. I don't know what side of the aisle he was on. I really don't. I, I have no clue. But people would send me bumper stickers, and they one guy sent me um, just it wasn't a yard sign, but I would love to get one uh, just to put out in my front yard. Sure, you know, this coming November, you know, just to have people go, "Are you kidding me?" You'd Ken be the Calvert? only viable option on the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the day will never come. Uh, would you ever do never... politics? No. No, I mean, you know, I, no, and I, I always no. say that only because of your history in in Detroit and in in Michigan, the Detroit metro area, and yeah. you you're you're from the area. You went to school at uh, uh, down the road at Aquinas College. Yeah, yeah. And so you're from you're from the area. You have a a fantastic reputation, and you would never consider politics. You would never. Uh, no, not at my, no, certainly not at my age. I'm 68 now, but I, no, I never did. You know, the, I mean, we already had, you know, we, you know, we had Arthur who was the mayor of Riffville, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, so I felt subordinate already to somebody who was, <laughs> oh, was already a mayor. Arthur Penhollow was the afternoon host at uh, WRIF and I was the midday host at WRIF and the combination of the two of us changing over each and every day became a highlight for a lot of people. It sure. really became an important part. You did not want to miss the crossover as we called it. They now call it cross talk, but, uh, it was a very, very, um, uh, interesting, um, time to be alive. Sure. And uh, there were a lot of things happening that Arthur would do late into the evening. And he would come in wearing that sort of look like, and say things like, why do I do I do the things that I do to myself? And I'd say, I don't know, why do you? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. So, I mean, just some great, great stuff. But uh, but you uh, guys those... came from an era, too, when you when radio was fun. And I, and I encourage oh. anybody to go in and listen to the episode that you did on your podcast where you actually say when, I think it's called When Radio Was Fun. Yeah, you know, I, exactly. And no, I think I, I think it was actually, I don't know, it, it was something like, who took the fun out of radio? Yes, or, that's what it was. Who took the fun like out of radio? That. And, and I, I go through this whole thing, and it was, I happened to be around at the time when morning radio was basically the all-night show. Yeah. Because the way it worked is the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the dream shift was 10 to 2, because that's when, when the hippies were getting up in the morning. Right. And then, of course, afternoon drive, it was just starting to happen. Six to ten at night, people were on their way to the concerts. Ten to two at night, people were on their way home from the concerts and heading to the bars. And then the all-night show was for the night trippers, as we used to call them. Oh, yeah. Morning radio was nothing. Morning radio was like you were banished to. to I mean, if you had the morning show, you are basically, you know, you're – it's a good spot for you, Ken. You'll do just fine. Just tell, you know, play a lot of music, time and temp, get them off to work. I happen to be around when when two really important people came into the atmosphere that I was, you know, the air that I was breathing from, and that was Steve Dahl. Yeah. And that was Howard Stern. Sure. And 
I was the program director at WABX in 1976. Long story short, Shelly Grafman, guy that owned the radio station, said, we got this fat guy down the hall who's eating cereal on the air, talking about how badly he wants to sleep with Linda Ronstadt. I want you to walk down there and fire his ass and get him out of here. <laughs> and I said, uh, Shelly, I got to be honest with you. I think you're making a really big mistake here. I, and by the way, we're very good friends. We're roommates. Uh, I can't do that. And he said, well, let me, simply put, you're working for me. If you want to continue to work for me, you will go down the hall after he gets off the air and politely ask him to get his stuff and get out of here. I said to Shelly one more time, Shelly, I think you're making a major mistake. He said, do it. I said, uh, Dow man, I got to see you for a second. And he goes, what's up? I said, Grafman's had it with the cereal and the Linda Ronstadt stuff, man. You got to go. He's letting you go. And he was like, you know, are you kidding me? He didn't say, are you kidding me? No, and, yeah. And he said, you know, and, it, and of course we, we ended up going, you know, I saw him later that because we lived together. Right. Right. And within 24 hours, W4 down the street where I started, called him and said, when can you start? Mm -hmm. And within two weeks, every bit of our audience had shifted over to follow this new guy who was cool. Right. He was funny. He was eating cereal on the air. He was doing stuff in the morning that no one was doing. Right. And once he went to the loop in Chicago, where, as we all know, Steve Dahl remains a monster in that market. Oh, yeah. This other guy came in, and his name was Howard Stern. And he was doing stuff that nobody had seen before or heard right. before, especially in Detroit. And bingo, bango. So I got to spend time with those guys. So, I mean, th th those were interesting times, you know. Well, and, also, and a lot of that stuff, too, I think when you go back to the, you know, you're talking late 70s, you know, in the 80s when you actually, had the, the Actually, the mid 70s. I don't mean to correct it, Eric. But okay, I'm mid -70s sorry. 70s was really big in radio. Mm -hmm. Radio was really shifting from being underground freeform radio stations to semi-formatted album-oriented rock stations, meaning they were starting to lean heavily on the power tracks. Okay. We started to hear words like power track. And, yeah. um, you know, and the record companies were starting to say, we really need you to hit uh, the boys are back in town from Thin Lizzy hard. Right. Okay, so that that's all. And go ahead, continue. So when, no, so when you say power tracks to people that are not familiar with the industry, you're talking your what? You're just your the songs that ev that everybody has heard a million times now. You yeah, everybody. As a matter of fact, I, I I kidded around near the end of my career, and somebody said, "WCSX is it a classic rocker?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah." And they said, "How do I find you?" I said, "Listen for the station playing more than a feeling. That's us, right? You know, <laughs> and that's yeah. that was basically you know the, uh, it's." It's don't stop believing radio. It's, yeah. you know, as long as you know it and can sing it, you know, they're going to play it. And that's, that was brand new because the underground guys, and I was part of that too, where you just walked over to the record library, you grabbed a record and you played whatever you want. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, those could, days are gone. Oh, <laughs> well, college, I'll tell you what, college radio, college radio still does it to some extent. Problem right. that I've always, the problem that I've always had with podcasting is that, you cannot play music on a podcast. No. If you, if you even dip a toe into anything that's commercially successful or whatever the case may be, uh, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, any one of those will they'll not. Find you. They will find you, and but they'll find you first. And so oh, yeah. first warning and only warning, don't ever do that again. And it's it's kind of like, you want to make a point so badly on a podcast. You need mm -hmm. that song, right? To show the show people what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. I, want, I wanted to play this Thin Lizzy song, but the station said I had to play this Thin Lizzy song. Right. Here's, here's the one I wanted to play because so many of you were calling me on the phone saying, "Why aren't you playing that?" Fascinating times. Yeah. So and much. Uh, so much politics behind the scenes involved involving uh, radio. It, well, and it's funny because, like you said, you were at. Uh, you know, when you talk about the the 70s being so 
uh, free with radio. And then, like I said, growing up, when I really started to pay attention to radio was probably, you know, 79, 80, 81, 82. And that to me was at that time for me seemed like it was insanely fun as opposed to what you end up hearing on the radio today. And it was the best, the best times of my life were the eighties. I mean, Oh, that was, a, that was a, that was a decadent era. I mean, everybody was doing all kinds of stupid stuff. I, I remember when I was, uh, I mean, I was in, I had a short seven year career in radio, but I was in rock radio in, uh, in Lansing. And I mean the 87 to 90, and we had a station van that the, the morning guy literally slept with everything that could possibly walk in front of him in yeah. the van at yeah. a at a bar gig, and I mean, it was like a rolling petri <laughs> dish from the CDC in Atlanta. It was uh, disgusting. Yeah. It was this white panel van that was kind of beat up a little bit. I mean, you yeah. wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't let your daughter anywhere near this thing. It, it, it all but was missing a, a bag of candy and a puppy inside of it. <laughs> it was so creepy, but but we just had so many fun <laughs> stories. You know, well, I mean, you, you I even mean, made it creepier this, that discussion <laughs> with, 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 with a puppy and a bag of candy. Jeez. But anyway. I mean, we had a, you know, our, our station owner's kid was a was a huge drunk, and he was in charge of like taking the station van. We we're giving away a boat one summer. Long story short, <laughs> he yeah. didn't strap the boat down in the back. <laughs> <laughs> it was on the trailer, but he had the station van and the boat slid off the trailer and was dragging down the freeway. <laughs> and I remember hearing the story and everybody at the radio station was horrified. I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> because I'm like, this is perfect. It's the station owner's kid. This was the perfect person to do this. The, kids, the kid can't get fired. He doesn't well, even technically work for us. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's daddy's station. I'm driving yeah. Patty's van, Penalo at a van, Arthur Penalo at a van, and I somebody put a bumper sticker on the back, you know, that now infamous bumper sticker. If this van's a knocking or if this van's a rocking, don't come right. knocking. And and that was true, by right. the way. And somebody else called it a shagging wagon. Oh yeah. He, yeah. What kind of you know, what was that carpeting that everybody had in their apartments back in the late 80s or in the eighties? Shag oh, carpeting. Shag carpeting. Good carpeting yeah. Mm, okay, so yeah, we did do drugs in the seventies uh, and eighties, Derek. What about I it? Mean, you had yep. so much. You had so much fun. You had. I gotta go. I'm gonna go back here. It's one thing I remember seeing a picture that you showed me of you and Seeger and Springsteen. Oh, when, when was that? When was that taken? Because you you introduced the two of them, didn't you? I did. I did introduce them. I mean, would you? You're talking about. Wait a minute. Look, let me try and. Oh, look at that! Oh, can you hang on? All right, now how do I get it? You're uh, your left. Oh, look. At, wow. Okay. Wow. Is that, is that framed up for you there? That okay. Is great. Yeah, you can see all th you can see all the three key faces, that's for sure. I was back uh backstage at Pine Knob and I was working for I took a I took a break from radio for 2 years. Columbia Records came calling one day and they said, "Hey, look, you know, the record guys love you. We like you. You're you're you get, you got it, uh, and we want it. You know, you got the right. secrets. You get this. You know, you, you can, you know, radio. You know these guys in radio. We want to give you this regional album job, movie to Chicago, and um, and let you just have at it. And I said, I'll do it in a heartbeat. I mean, they literally doubled my income in one in one phone call. So I said, you yeah, no problem, not a you know done deal. So I would get assigned to various acts all over the Columbia label. Now that included Lou Rawls. That included Neil uh, Neil Diamond. Uh, Bar I didn't, sure. you know, I didn't go out. I didn't go out with those guys, but I did go out on the road with, you know, with, with Bruce, and I would go out on the road with Aerosmith and uh, partied like a rock star. I mean, and we did I can't party. I uh, got to tell you, I and I went out with. We had one album, a one album deal with Ron Wood. And uh, the new barbarians, and it was uh, Keith Richards, Ron Wood, Stanley Clark was on bass, Zigaboo, Bobby Keys on horn. It was just a, it was a phenomenal trip, and I got assigned to that 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 group of gangsters, man. And I got to tell you something, I have never, ever, ever seen people party like <laughs> Keith Richards and Ron Wood ever in my life. I mean, after two days, I said, I got to get out of here. I'm going to, or they're going to put me in a body bag. I mean, this is just, how do these guys do it? 
But when things in 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 78, 79, Bruce and I had formed a pretty good relationship working together. I knew when to leave him alone. I knew when to knock on his door and then tell him that the vans were downstairs. That particular shot, we were on tour. It was the darkness tour, darkness on the, uh, you know, it's a town, yeah. And, and, and we were going to play the Chrysler arena in Ann Arbor the next night, September 3rd. And we didn't have anything to do. We were in Detroit early. He said, anything going on? And I said, yeah, uh, Seeger's playing Pine Knob. And he said, I've never met Bob Seeger. He said, Kenny, let's go see Bob Seeger. And I said, okay, <laughs> we'll go see Bob Seeger. And so that's a good yeah. Springsteen impression. Nice job. Yeah. So we went out to uh, Pine Knob and we rolled up in a tour bus and they were like, no, whoa, whoa, who are you? And I said, Ken Calvert, Columbia Records, Bruce Springsteen, the band, just a few of us, not the whole band. It's Bruce Springsteen. And I was like, why are you here? I said, I want to introduce Bob Seeger, who I know very well, to Bruce Springsteen. They've never met. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to turn this bus around and get out of here because you're, you know, we're on this list. Luckily, I saw Bill Blackwell, Bob's long time, long time road manager, still right. is. And he saw me and he was like, one of those deals. And I said, and so he comes running out and he tells the guy to move by the way. And I said, I said, Bill, uh, Bruce Springsteen, he just, wa just wants to pop in and say hi to Bob. And it was like, open the gates. Open the gates. And we tss, roll into the back, go into the dressing room. Seeger's probably going on within 20 minutes. We go into the back. Photographer, local guy by the name of Thomas Wessler said, oh, my God, I got to get this. So they take that picture and then immediately, bink, knock me out and the two of them pose for about 20 more sure and that picture that picture of the two of them has been seen around the world but i enabled that shot on september 2nd 1978 that's, that's insane story. yeah i mean and, and to really try to wrap your brain around that and to think that the two of them would go on yeah would go on and be who they are i oh. mean just, i and mean rock and roll rock and roll royalty yeah, and good friends. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so that was, um, to say that was the highlight, at the time, I think I was so peed out, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself, I think I was so PO'd at the guy who really stood us up at the front gate for right. the longest time, wasted a lot of valuable time. Springsteen was cool, but I could tell he was getting hot, and, right. he had, you know, he, he you don't want to get, Bruce angry, you know what I mean? So um, it all worked well, it's out one great. Of those things, in defense of the guy working the gate, I mean, he's technically doing his job. I mean, and it's... Technically, and, technically and, uh, yeah. Yeah. He's, but, Seager's, Seager's playing his hometown, what, less than a year or two after Live Bullet, and right. now he's big time, and now everybody knows Bob Seager. And Bob just finally had to just like, Hey, you know, we're not at the Oakland Mall anymore. We're not playing parking lots. <laughs> you know. The Oakland we're, Mall. You know. These are just some classic Michigan references, Detroit metro yeah. area references that uh, anybody listening to this who's not from the metro area, Pine Knob is, by the way, the big outdoor music amphitheater. Yeah. I'll call well, it it's not, yeah. music yeah. theater. But uh, if you talk to the uh, old school people like Ken and myself and a number of other people from Michigan that uh, grew up, when it was called Pine Knob, it's always called Pine Knob. We're never going to change. I'm never changing the name of it. I'm not. No, no, and and the bands won't either. As a matter of fact, no. I know it was Peter Frampton's birthday today. He's seventy, turned seventy, and these are the things that start to kill you and remind you how old you are, especially with the uh, uh, the coronavirus. You know, they always talk about, especially those of you that are over sixty years of age. And I'm going, yeah. What about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 What a, yeah. So, so what, you know, but, uh, 
But no, I mean, we're all, you know, we're getting older, but the memories are great. And that's why, you know, uh, follow me on Twitter and Facebook. I'm easy to find Ken Calvert. No, absolutely. And check out the yeah, podcast. Ken. So many, so many killer interviews and great yeah. stories to share on there. What's one of the craziest things that uh, I know the studio uh, always was a great uh, hotbed when fans would come in and do interviews uh, either the day before the show or the day of the show. What's yeah, the, the craziest yeah. thing that you can recall that happened in the studio with a band or a performer? Uh, um, <laughs> well, See, well, I, I, the look on your face right now is saying, this is what I remember that would be really uh, bad for me to say. And this is what I remember that's going to be that's going to be good to say and going to be entertaining enough, but not get me into trouble. No, I don't think I can get you into trouble, but you remember Sam Kinison, the uh, comedian. Oh, yeah. And... Sam liked to do uh, something, uh, and he yeah, liked to do he liked to do a lot of it. And um, he would come in, and uh, uh, we would get busy with a little. Well, it was popular in the seventies um, and the eighties, probably somewhat now too. I'm talking about that white powder. I'm not talking. Oh, yeah. about, I'm not. I'm talking about cocaine. Oh yeah. And, um, Sam enjoyed cocaine, and as jocks, we also would occasion. Occasionally, sure. occasionally try a little, a little <laughs> but uh, he was. I remember one time it was just I had I, I hit it a little too hard. You know what I mean? Right. It was like when when they talk about you know he laid out a little too much, and uh, it was hard. I was like I couldn't. You know, you know it was just like okay. <laughs> Yeah, but that wasn't so bad as, as I will tell you about, I'll never forget the first time I saw Queen in the studio. They came in and because we were just down the street from the hall and so they were already dressed basically for the stage. And I will never forget looking at Freddie Mercury. He walked around the studio. He never took a seat. And he just sort of preened and walked around in a very unusual sort of a way. Right. Couldn't help, couldn't help but notice his bite. You really couldn't help but notice it. Right. Brian, Brian May did did most of the talking and was just a wonderful guy. But you know, when I watched Bohemian Rhapsody, my wife said to me, "Did you ever meet Freddie Mercury?" I said, "I did," and she said, "Was he like this?" I said. He was beyond anything I can describe. He was, yeah. He was really, uh, uh, he was a queen. I mean, he was, he mm -hmm. was in circumstances long uh, as a summer day, man. I, I got to tell you something. It was fascinating. Johnny Winter was so drunk we couldn't get him out physically. Get him out of the studio. I remember that day. I mean, it was Johnny. You got to go. And he, he just it wasn't going in. It was not making any sense. Um, uh, Paul McCartney, I flew to Chicago to meet Paul McCartney and we got together in a hotel room and just had a great time. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, luckily I have a picture of it, but what you didn't see was how bad my hand was shaking, you know, <laughs> the, the photographer did a good job, but no, it's, I mean, to this day, I'm still a groupie. I mean, it never ever changed. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I think that's I love cool. meeting rock and rollers. What's the of all the legendary musicians that you've connected with through the years? Who do you still have on your cell phone that you can call right now and hang with? I could probably call any member of Journey. Okay. I mean, right this moment, I do have all of their numbers. Right. Um, I could certainly call Seeger. You know, I mean, uh, I I'm not sure. Bob is a very curious guy about the telephone and social interacting i mean he he's just not one to go oh hold on i gotta take this you know what i mean right it's kind of um it's kind of interesting that way but but certainly greg raleigh or or jonathan kane or right. uh, neil john or uh i don't know about steve so much i could now because of the fact that he's back in action right but um 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 i, I gosh there are so many guys that oh. i Sure. So when I Peter, come back to Michigan, if there's an oddball chance that I bring a bottle over to your house and we just happen to be sitting there and you happen to call Bob Seeger and you say, hey, I've got a bottle of uh, uh, some 
great Irish whiskey sure. that uh, I'd like you to come by and have some. You well, know. I got to be I got to be brutally honest with you. I think Bob has been sober for for almost 25 years. So Okay, let's take I'll take that back. Uh how about I bring over a bottle of <laughs> uh I'll bring, I'll, bring, I'll bring a bottle of uh of Verner's ginger ale. Let's keep it uh, as Michigan as possible. How about if you bring a a, a Verner's ginger ale and a pack of Marlboros? And I uh, think uh, we'll be in good shape. Listen, we'll if I can be bigger, hey, it's gonna cost me. It's gonna cost me ginger ale and Marlboros. I'm solid. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be Verners. Verners, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Verners. Yeah, can't, I'm not, can't, no. can't be Canada Dry, I'm man. Not taking no Canada, Canada Dry or Schweppes, any of that crap. But what, uh, uh, go ahead. I, yeah, I'm just thinking. I mean, you, you're you're giving me some imponderables here, but I but continue. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I mean, you're obviously you're a huge Detroit sports fan. You were the uh, longtime public address announcer for the Pistons. If you no. were to uh, put together a Mount Rushmore of your Detroit sports figures, who would they no. be? Uh, baseball would be Al Kaline. May he rest in peace. What a shocker that was. Um, Gordy Howe. Mm-hmm. So I've got hockey and I've got baseball, basketball. I got to come back to basketball. Maybe uh, Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, yeah, it would be Isaiah Thomas. That's what I was thinking all along, but I wanted to make sure. Right. Yeah. Um. Um. Uh, and. Um. So we got we got I, oh, uh, uh, football would be Barry Sanders. Absolutely. Slammer. I'm like yeah. I don't know how. I didn't know how far you were going to go. So, so it goes K-Line, it goes K-Line, Howe, Isaiah, and, um, and, Barry. Um, and Barry Sanders. Yeah, that's a no-brainer for Detroit. Yeah. Oh, super you know. easy. Yeah, you um, can't get there. I mean, you could argue Ty Cobb. You could argue Steve Eiserman. I mean, I, there's... I, you know what? Uh, nice. yeah, I mean, but Gordie Howe, you got to just, you know, I, I think Eiserman would say no, no. You know, yeah, put been, Howe up there. I was class enough actor where he would say, yeah. no, you got to put Gordy yeah. House face up there. So, yeah, I totally yeah. get that. I don't think you would find anybody argue with, with Al Kaline. You would find a lot of people arguing over Isaiah Thomas just because yeah. apparently there's a lot of good, there's a lot of some bad and some mm -hmm. other, you know. Yeah. I mean, so, but the good certainly, I mean, he was, he was, he was well. He was the the focal point. He was the guy that that he, he was, was. He stirred the drink, man, and that that bad boy run was great. That was another one that was one of the greatest times of my life because it was it was simply done on a dare, um, and I you know, I happened to go to a Pistons game with a bunch of buddies at the Pontiac Silver Dome, and the guy that was doing it was a guy by the name of Gary May, and he was like da 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 da, and I said I can do that. You know, and I was like, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I was having a cocktail in a place called the main event, which was connected to oh, yeah. in, inside the Silver Dome, the Pontiac Silver Dome. Dome. Yeah. And uh, the public relations director, Matt Dobeck, uh, was sitting there and, um, you know, radio, you know, talking back and forth. Because sure. um, we did, you know, they did other things outside the sports ropes um, at, you know, at Palace Sports. Long story short on that, we started talking and I did my, hey, you want to hear my Gary May impersonation? He said, sure, go ahead and do it. And I went, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'd like to ask you to please stand. He goes, ooh, hey, uh, you do that pretty well. He said, I got to keep you in mind in case uh, Gary May ever calls in sick. Gary May calls in sick. And bingo, Bailey. That was the end of it. Yeah. And that was uh, the wall. Uh, all of right there, all of the next, next Wally series. Sat down, Lou Gehrig took over. Yeah. And you know it was it was strange because Gary loved adored doing that gig, right? And um, he he coached football, so in the fall I ended up doing all the exhibition games, and that's kind of what cost him the gig because I ended right. up getting into it, and that's when Joe Dumars was a rookie. Yep, and that's when I came up with that celebrated number four, Joe Dumars. Like, oh yeah, come on, folks, you don't get it. It's like Lou Pinella, Lou Whitaker. Uh -huh. You know, the old, they're not booing him. They're saying Lou, you know, they're not booing him. They're saying do. So, um, but no, great times, man. I've been a blessed, blessed guy. Killer, Bless. killer times. Last yep. question, obviously a Michigan native, uh, American yeah. or Lafayette Coney Island. Which one's your uh, selection? Slam dunk Lafayette. There you go. Slam dunk. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question for you, sir. 
then yes, I'll sir. let you go. Um, I don't know how much uh, time you allow for these, but um, what are comedians, what are stand-up comedians doing now that that this horrible virus has completely uh, overwhelmed the world? I no, mean, everyone's it's, just kind of hanging out. I mean, this has been a great opportunity for me to connect with a lot of people doing this. I mean, this initial uh, show that I do here, it started off with me just goofing around at the bar, having conversations. That's where Drink With Derek came in was me just shooting yeah. it on my cell phone. And that yeah. was it, like at a bar talking to friends. And that was, you know, that was the whole dialogue. And then all of a sudden this came about and I'm like, I can't obviously meet up with people because we're doing the whole distancing thing. So I'm like, ah, a buddy of mine turned me on to this particular platform. I'm like, this opens up so many more doors for me to talk to a bunch of other people. So, you know, I think like anything, you know, anybody who's going through this pandemic, I mean, you can make it as miserable or as productive as you want. I mean, it's, I've, I've cleaned out a lot of rooms in my house, a lot of closets, a lot of cupboards. And, and now you just wait for everything to kind of calm down and all this stuff to uh, kind of reschedule. I mean, that's like out here in Las Vegas, we have so many shows that got canceled and postponed. I mean, around the country, but yeah, you know, like everybody's going through this pandemonium of uh, uh, logistics, trying to get this stuff squared away. I can't imagine trying to, you know, reroute a Rolling Stones tour that's gotten that's lost yeah. or, or yeah, anything that, for that matter. Yeah. So it's uh, it's crazy. And so it's like right now, comedians, we're just kind of hanging back and waiting to see when things open back up again. And I think uh, this is a perfect time for people to start laughing. Everybody's waiting to go out and do something. And I think comedy is a very uh, uh, affordable fun escape to uh, go out and not have to lay out, you know, a bunch of money for a, a concert if you can't afford it, if you got hit hard by what's going on here. So it's, uh, it's going to be exciting when everything opens back up again, really looking forward to it. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I, I feel, I feel bad for the guys that, you know, because I know that so many of the guys, you know, buddies like Tim Allen, Dave Coulier, uh, yeah. Mike Binder, those guys, you know, who hit it big, you know, they're fine. You know, there's nothing to worry about there, but, you know, then I think about the middle and the MCs and the guys who are just dipping their toes into comedy sure. and how, how it was week to week, you know, you know, you get in the, you get in the truck, you drive to Nebraska, or you drive to, um, Minnesota, or you drive to Ohio, Virginia, Kentucky, whatever for mm -hmm. the weekend, you know, to bag maybe six, 700 bucks. Yeah. Come back and pay your bills. And now poof, pay you your know? bills. Yeah, well, aren't you, aren't you adorable? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, on that, on that, Ken, on that, great, that great, yeah. great talking to you, my friend. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough for your time. And I highly recommend everybody check out the uh, Ken Calvert Show podcast, the Ken Calvert Show dot com. Find it on yeah. all the social media platforms. But uh, listen to that podcast if you're a um, I, uh, certainly a fan of music. I mean, your interviews on there that you have the archives of just the uh, incredible conversations that you've had with all these uh, brilliant uh, singers, songwriters, musicians through the years is just uh, amazing. Oh, you know what? One of the things that I found that I've got to finish editing, it's, it's been a, a mother. It, go, it goes back to 1990 or 91. Lyle Lovett came into the studio with three other guys mm -hmm. and played for a couple of hours. And it was so cool. And it, it, and I mean, the way it was mic'd up. Uh, and there's also a podcast on there that goes way back. But Donovan Leach came into the studio. And to hear this guy do Hurdy Gurdy Man and, you know, Sunshine Superman and all of these songs live, it's it's killer. You, I mean, yeah. I can't believe that. Luckily, we, luckily we were rolling dats, digital audio tapes. And bingo, the quality is CD quality, so it's great. So good. I know you got to run. I know you got to run. Thank you no, for doing. No worries at all, man. It's great. It's great talking with you. It's a. Yeah. Uh, again, I'll get the. I'll get the Verners and the Marlboros, and I'll be at your house here in a few days. I'll call the Dabber. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my brother. Take care, buddy. All right, buddy. All, right. all right, peace out. What do I do? Do I hang up? How do I go? <laughs> How do I leave? How do I?